minutes before I uh, call on council assisting to uh, open this next round of hearings. I want to make some comments uh, in order to address what appear to be some misconceptions about the Commission's procedures. These misconceptions have emerged in a number of communications which have been addressed to the Commission since the last round of hearings by persons seeking to agitate for the Commission to devote more attention to the investigation of the CBA takeover of Bankwest, either generally or in relation to particular cases. And unsurprisingly, some wider currency has been given to these ideas in reports of what has been said about the Commission's work in connection with CBA's takeover of Bankwest and the work of the Commission more generally. It's been said that consumers whose cases have been the subject of case studies heard by the Commission have not been given the opportunity to cross-examine bank witnesses, whereas banks have been allowed to cross-examine consumers. This is not correct. Practice Guideline 3 sets down the Commission's processes for the granting of leave to appear. The practice Guidelines make clear that leave will generally be granted when a person has been summoned to give evidence or is the subject of an inquiry to be undertaken. Not every consumer who has been summoned to give evidence has sought leave, but in each instance where they have, leave has been granted. Similarly, in each instance where a consumer who is the subject of a case study has sought leave, that leave has been granted. Practice guideline makes clear that where a person uh, has been granted leave, they may be represented by a legal representative at a hearing without the need for that legal representative to obtain separate authorization under the Act. It also makes clear that a person who's been granted leave or their legal representative may, among other things, apply for leave to cross-examine. In most cases, consumers who've sought leave have not sought to cross-examine. Now, I might sur surmise that this is because they felt that there's nothing further to be asked of a particular witness having regard to the examination undertaken by counsel assisting. There may be other reasons. That's only speculation. The point's this. The opportunity for cross-examination has been available. As I've said, it's not been taken up, but the opportunity was given. It may also be observed that entities have not always sought to cross-examine every witness who's given testimony which is adverse to that entity. A related misconception is that because the Commission is only issuing summonses to consumer witnesses a short time before each round of evidence, there is not enough time for the witness to brief lawyers to represent them at the hearings. This assumes, wrongly, that there's been no interaction between the Commission and the witness in advance of the hearings. Each consumer witness has been aware well in advance of the hearings uh, that they may be called. But in the context of this commission, the issuing of summonses has been to ensure that various protections under the Act are extended to the particular witness rather than, in some others, to compel reluctant witnesses to appear. As I've already noted, each consumer witness has the opportunity to seek leave and to be represented and to seek to cross-examine entity witnesses. It's also important to observe that Commission staff provide each witness with, it, with information about claiming expenses, 
including expenses for legal representation. The Attorney General's Department administers a scheme for the provision of legal financial assistance for royal commissions and inquiries. The Commonwealth Guidelines for Legal Financial Assistance 2012 Addendum for the Royal Commission into Misconduct in the Banking, Superannuation and Financial Services Industry states that entities, apart from financial services entities and individuals, may be eligible for assistance to cover reasonable legal representation and disbursement costs if they're called to appear at a hearing of or attend an interview with the Royal Commission or are issued with a notice to produce by the Commission. There is therefore a process available for consumer witnesses to obtain financial assistance for legal representation at a hearing if they wish. The Commission is not aware of any instances where a consumer witness has not been able to cross-examine due to lack of financial assistance. Moving beyond those matters, I want to say something about the issues relating to CBA's conduct after its takeover of Bankwest in 2008. <coughs> Since the conclusion of the third round of hearings, a number of persons have written to the Commission about that aspect of the hearings. Some of these have suggested that insufficient time was devoted to that matter, and that more case studies should have been examined. However, as explained by Council assisting both in the opening and the closing of that round, the work of the Commission regarding the CBA takeover of Bankwest to that date had been intensive and was not limited to consideration of the circumstances of the four witnesses who gave evidence. Some of these further communications have also proceeded from the premise that it is the Commission's role to advance the interests of those who describe themselves as Bankwest's victims. That, of course, misunderstands the role and the duty of a Royal Commissioner, which is to inquire without fear or favour into matters falling within the terms of reference. Neither I nor Council assisting or the solicitors assisting the Commission carry any brief for those who assert a grievance arising from the takeover of Bankwest or indeed any other issue. We are here to inquire. Another misconception which has appeared in many of these further communications is that findings have already been made by me. They have not. Council assisting has made submissions as to the findings that they submit are open on the basis of the evidence heard during the course of the third round of hearings, but I have not yet made any findings. My findings about these matters and my reasons as to why those decisions are ultimately made are matters to be dealt with when I report in accordance with my terms of reference, a task that remains some time away. And in the meantime, the Commission can continues to consider and will keep under constant review how best it should execute the tasks committed to it by the letter's patent. Now with that in mind, additional information which is received by the Commission will be carefully considered. <coughs> to facilitate that process, we have indicated to those who have written to the Commission in recent weeks about the Bankwest matter, that if there are additional matters that they wish to raise with the Commission, they should do so. However, we have made clear that we will derive most assistance if those who take up this invitation focus on identifying matters which have not already been raised with us and identifying evidence not mere assertions and conjecture, that is said to be relevant to the consideration of these matters. And of course, I will bear well in mind that any additional material raised by this process 
may in turn trigger procedural fairness obligations in favour of other persons. But as a final comment on this aspect of the matter, I must emphasise that a very considerable amount of research and analysis has already been devoted to the Bankwest takeover by those assisting me. Now it's also important that I say something uh, about the grant of leave to appear at this round of hearings which we are about to begin. <coughs> those who have been granted leave to appear have been notified and those parties have indicated who will be appearing for them. There is therefore no occasion to take or announce appearances. For this round of hearings, there were many applications for leave to appear which I did not allow. The solicitors assisting the Commission will have written to each of those persons to explain why I got to that answer. Almost everyone whose application for leave to appear was refused wants to say that they have been affected by conduct of a kind that falls within the terms of reference. They want to have what happened to them publicly examined and publicly acknowledged. I understand that. Almost all of those whose applications for leave to appear uh, have been refused have made online submissions to the Commission. I read those submissions before deciding whether to grant leave. I looked at them very carefully, as did members of the Commission staff. Council and solicitors assisting the Commission looked at those and at all of the other submissions about issues of the kind that will be examined in this round of hearings before deciding what case studies would be examined publicly. I expect that Council assisting may have something more to say about that in her opening. I remain of the view that proceeding by case study is the best way I have of finding out what has happened, finding out what was done or not done in response to what happened, identifying what could have been done and what should have been done in response, and then thinking about what follows from those conclusions. And proceeding in that way means inevitably that some who want their cases dealt with publicly do not have their cases chosen. As will be apparent, however, from what I've said, serious consideration has been given to what case studies would be examined in the course of the public hearings and which people and entities would be given leave to appear. Ms. Orr. Commissioner, this is the fourth round of public hearings for this Royal Commission into misconduct in the banking, superannuation and financial services industry. This round of hearings will inquire into issues arising from interactions between Australians living in regional and remote communities and financial services entities. As at the 30th of June 2017, around 6.9 million people, or 28% of Australia's population, lived in regional or remote areas. The term regional and remote, or rural and remote, generally encompasses all areas outside Australia's major cities. The Australian Statistical Geogra Geography Standard defines remoteness areas into five classes, major cities, inner regional, outer regional, remote and very remote. These classes of remoteness are calculating using the Accessibility Remoteness Index of Australia, or ARIA. ARIA is a geographic measure of remoteness, measuring the distance people have to travel to obtain services from five service centres, which are identified by population size. Service centres are localities with populations greater than 1,000 persons, 
which are considered to contain at least some basic level of services, such as health, education or retail services. The further away from one or more service centres, the more remote the location is considered to be. The number of Australians living in regional or remote communities has remained relatively constant since 2007. The Northern Territory has the highest percentages of people living in outer regional, remote or very remote areas. 60% live in outer regional areas, 20% live in remote areas and 21% live in very remote areas. People who live in regional or remote areas are more likely to have a lower level of access to products and services, including financial products and services. APRA collects information on the number of branches of authorised deposit taking institutions or ADIs uh, and other face to face service providers in regional and remote areas, as well as the number of ATMs. Access to a bank branch, other face-to-face -face service or ATM decreases as remoteness increases. As at June 2017, data from APRA shows that of the 5,814 branches of ADIs, 2,484, around 43 per cent, were in regional or remote areas with only 4% of those being in remote or very remote areas. Of the 4,674 other face-to-face -face services provided by ADIs, around 54% were in regional or remote areas, with only 7% in remote or very remote areas. Of the 13,814 ATMs in Australia, Around 27% were in regional or remote areas, of which only 2% were in remote or very remote areas. Because of the greater distances involved to access products and services, Australians living in regional and remote areas may access financial services in different ways to those in metropolitan areas. This may include greater use of services such as agricultural banking services, which provide products tailored to people engaged in farming and farming related activities, such as seasonal finance or farm management deposits. Community banks, being locally owned and operated banks, which function as a franchise of a, of a financial services entity. Mobile lenders and Australia Post banking services. This round of hearings will inquire into three topics. It is important to note that the topics to be explored about issues affecting people in regional and remote communities have not been selected because they are issues which only affect consumers living in those areas. Some of the issues that we will canvass can and do also significantly affect consumers living in major cities and metropolitan areas. Rather, the topics have been selected because they are considered to be significant issues within regional and remote communities with the potential to affect the financial well-being of Australians who live in those communities. The Commission has consulted widely with bodies which provide assistance to consumers living in regional and remote areas about their dealings with financial services entities. It has done so in order to identify and understand these significant issues. We'll provide further detail about the consultation process throughout these hearings. During the hearings, the Commission will also hear directly from representatives of a number of bodies with whom the Commission consulted. The first topic we'll explore in these hearings is issues in relation to finance provided to agricultural businesses. The agricultural industry is an important contributor to the Australian economy and a primary source of jobs in many rural and regional areas. In 2017, approximately 260,000 Australians were employed in the agriculture industry. 
As at 2016, there were 84,515 farming businesses in Australia with an estimated value of agricultural operations of $40,000 or more. Businesses operating in this industry face particular challenges which affect their financial position, including exposure to significant and sometimes prolonged weather events, to pests and to commodity price fluctuations. The Commission will examine five case studies on the topic of agricultural business lending. Those case studies will examine the conduct of five financial services entities and explore the particular circumstances of multiple farming families. The second topic we will explore in this round of hearings is issues in respect of home and contents insurance policies arising from loss incurred as a result of natural disaster events. Natural disaster events have long lasting financial and social effects on affected individuals and communities. It is estimated that insurance losses from these events over the past two decades total approximately $25 billion. It has also been estimated that non-tangible impacts, which include health and well-being and employment, may be equal to or greater than the financial impacts caused by these events. When a natural disaster event occurs in a regional or remote area of Australia, issues arise as a result of the physical location of the affected communities, including issues around the availability of temporary accommodation. The conduct of financial services entities when handling claims following a natural disaster is an important issue for Australians living in those areas. The Commission will examine four case studies which address the topic of natural disaster insurance. The third topic which we will explore in this round of hearings is issues which can arise in interactions between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in regional or remote communities and financial services entities. As at 2016, 649,171 people identified as being of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander origin, comprising 2.8% of the total Australian population. Just under two thirds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live outside of capital city areas. Almost one in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in very remote areas. Of people living in remote areas, the proportion who are Indigenous is relatively high. In 2011, 45% of people living in very remote areas and 16% of people living in remote areas were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Customers living in remote areas encounter issues that arise from the physical lack of access to banking and financial services due to the distance between where they live and the required services. The Commission will examine four case studies regarding interactions between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional or remote communities and financial services entities. For most of this first week of this two-week block of hearings, we will explore issues relevant to the first topic, the topic of finance provided to agricultural businesses. The remainder of this opening statement will address that topic. Further opening statements will be delivered in the course of the hearings in relation to each of the second and third topics. Before turning to our first topic, finance provided to agricultural businesses, we wish to say something about why these hearings are being conducted in Brisbane. Over the last few months, we have consulted broadly with a number of industry participants, regulators and affected consumers in relation to each of the three topics considered in this hearing block. Those consultations revealed that Queensland had a high concentration of consumers affected by conduct in the first two topics, agricultural finance 
and natural disaster insurance. While farmers across the country have been affected by a variety of factors, the Queensland cattle industry in particular has confronted a number of difficult circumstances that placed many farmers under financial pressure and have led to disputes with banks. In relation to natural disaster insurance, while a number of regions of Australia have faced disasters of various kinds, four of which will be considered in case studies this week and next week, Tropical Cyclone Debbie was a major event and affected a very large number of consumers in northern Queensland. Commissioner, you have expressed the view to those of us assisting you that particularly for this block of hearings, you considered it important for the Commission to conduct hearings in locations near those affected by the conduct being examined. The capital of Queensland was the logical location for the first week of these hearings, given the focus in this week's hearings on events affecting farmers from various locations around Queensland and on Queensland as affected by Tropical Cyclone Debbie as well as the need for the Commission to sit in a location with the facilities required by the Commission to discharge its work. Turning to finance provided to agricultural businesses, we begin by providing an overview of the agricultural, forestry and fishing industry and its significance to the Australian economy. Second, we will explore the key challenges faced by agricultural businesses in Australia. Third, we will identify the main types of agricultural finance in Australia. Fourth, we will examine some of the key features of the legal framework governing the operation of loans to agricultural businesses. Agricultural businesses vary in size from small businesses to very large institutional businesses. This hearing will focus on small and medium agricultural business customers. Fifth, we will identify the forms of dispute resolution accessible to agricultural businesses. Sixth, we will summarise what consumers have told the Commission about their experiences with agricultural finance, primarily through public submissions submitted via the Commission's online portal. Seventh, we will summarise what financial services entities have acknowledged to the Commission as their own misconduct and conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations. We will also summarise information provided by the financial services entities about the nature of their agricultural finance operations. Finally, we will briefly address the nature of the evidence that will be given this week in relation to agricultural lending, providing an overview of the case studies that the Commission will be considering. We will highlight the key themes and questions that we see running through these case studies, upon which we will invite written submissions at the end of these hearings. We turn first to some key features of the agricultural industry. The Commission has published two background papers concerning the agricultural industry. One was prepared by the Office of the Royal Commission and the other by the Commonwealth Department of Agriculture. Both papers are available on the Commission's website. These papers reveal that the agricultural industry is a very significant contributor to the Australian economy. In the financial year 2016 to 17, the value of Australian agricultural exports was approximately $51.5 billion, accounting for approximately 15% of the value of Australia's merchandise trade. In the same period, approximately 70% of Australia's agricultural production took place in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Each of these states produced over a fifth of the nation's total agricultural production, amounting to in excess of $14 billion of production per state. New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland also had the highest shares of farm businesses in Australia as at 2015 to 16. 
New South Wales had 25,716 farm businesses, being 30% of all farm businesses in Australia. Victoria had 20,532 farm businesses, being 24% of all farm businesses in Australia. And Queensland had 17,929 farm businesses, being 21% of all farm businesses in Australia. In the financial year 2016 to 17, the largest agricultural commodities produced in Australia by gross value were livestock, comprising around 33% by gross value as a percentage of Australia's total agricultural production, broad acre crops such as wheat, barley, canola and sugarcane, comprising around 33%, and livestock products such as milk, wool and eggs, comprising around 13%. As I've already noted, the agricultural industry is a key source of jobs in many rural and regional areas of Australia. Uh, and as at 2016, there were 84,515 farming businesses in Australia with an estimated value of agricultural operations of $40,000 or more. We next turn to some of the particular challenges faced by agricultural businesses. As we have already noted, the particular challenges which affect their financial position and their ability to meet repayment obligations include exposure to weather events and climate, climate variations, pests and diseases, and commodity price fluctuations. Each of these can result in periods of low income for affected businesses and in severe cases can imperil the viability of the business. Primary industries are particularly sensitive to weather extremes and variations in climate. The Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences notes that Australia's climate is highly variable with lower mean rainfall and higher rainfall variability than in most other nations and that as a result agriculture in Australia is subject to more revenue volatility than in almost any other country in the world. The Bureau also notes that changing seasonal conditions are difficult to predict accurately beyond the current season, which can have significant implications for crop yields and livestock production cycles. Pests and diseases can be a major issue faced by agricultural business. Outbreaks of pests and diseases can result in losses of entire crops or yields with consequential financial difficulties. A significant portion of Australia's agricultural commodities are exported. As a result, global commodity pr prices and global demand for commodities, as well as the exchange rate, can have a significant impact on agricultural businesses. The same forces that drive up global prices for agricultural commodities also put upward pressure on the prices of many inputs used by the farming sector. For some parts of the industry, these increases in costs have been a significant constraint on profitability. Further, because export trade is regulated by at least two governments of Australia and of the receiving nation, Farmers are subject to regulatory risk arising from changes to the rules governing export and import generally, or to the rules governing the export or import of a particular product. One such decision, the 2011 ban on the live export of cattle to Indonesia, will feature in a number of the case studies. We turn next to the types of agricultural finance. There are three main types of funding in the agricultural sector, debt finance, equity finance and government grants. Data published in August 2017 by the Australian Bureau of Statistics on funding to the agricultural, forestry and fishing industry indicates that in 2015 to 16, Approximately 27% of these businesses sought debt or equity finance, 
of this, 95% involved debt finance and 12% involved equity finance. These types of financing are not mutually exclusive. Almost 85% of debt finance is sought from banks. As this data reveals, debt finance is by far the most common type of funding sought. It follows that farmers have a significant dependence on financial services entities. As at the 30th of June last year, total rural debt in Australia was $71.7 billion. This was equivalent to around 2.3% of net loans and advances held as assets by ADIs. The share of rural debt held by banks has increased over the last decade. In 2007, banks' share of rural debt was around 89%. As at the 30th of June last year, that share had risen to approximately 96% or 68.6 .6 billion out of the total 71.7 billion. In the 2015 to 16 financial year, the most common types of new or additional debt finance sought by participants in the agricultural, forestry and fishing industries were new loans with a term of more than one year, that was 42.5%, new capital or finance or higher purchase agreements, 34.7%, new bank overdrafts, 30.3%, 30 increases in the amount of existing credit facilities or limits, 21.7%, and new mortgage loans, 17.1%. The participants' primary reasons for seeking finance were business expansion, that amounted to 34%, to maintain short-term cash flow or liquidity, 32.7%, to replace, upgrade or purchase additional non-IT equipment or machinery, 29.1, 28.18 and 26% respectively, and finally, to ensure survival of the business, 25.4%. There has been an increase in the share of bank source debt outstanding for businesses in the agricultural, forestry and fishing sector with larger credit facilities. In particular, debt held by businesses with a credit facility of 2 million or more has increased from holding around 21% of debt in the sector to holding around 46% of debt in the sector during the period from December 2002 to December last year. That is not to say that all farms carry large bank debts, as at the 30th of June 2016, more than two thirds of aggregate broadacre debt was held by 12% of farms, with these farms producing approximately half of the value of broadacre farm production. For the dairy industry, more than two-thirds of total debt was held by one-third of farms. And as at the 30th of June last year, broadacre farm debt stood at an average of $616,900 per farm, while dairy farm debt stood at an average of $926,700 per farm. One significant source of assistance to primary producers suffering as a result of climatic events is government grants and subsidies. The Australian Government, through the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, provide grants and financial assistance programs to businesses and individuals to help boost productivity and exports. State governments also provide grants and subsidies to the rural sector either through government departments, specific corporations set up to provide assistance to the rural sector, or both. The Farm Management Deposits Scheme is intended to assist primary producers to deal more effectively with fluctuations in cash flows. It is designed to increase the self-reliance of Australian primary producers by helping them manage their financial risk 
and meet their business costs in low income years by building up cash reserves. The scheme allows eligible primary producers to set aside pre-tax income from production in years of high income, which they can draw on in future years when they need it, such as for restocking or replanting when conditions start to improve. Income deposited into a farm management deposit account is tax deductible in the financial year the deposit is made. It becomes taxable income in the financial year in which it is withdrawn. The following eligibility conditions currently apply to farm management deposits. The primary producer's non-primary production income must be less than $100,000 in the financial year they make the deposit. The primary producer may hold up to a maximum of $800,000 in farm management deposits. To retain the taxation benefits, a farm management deposit must be held for at least 12 months with an authorised deposit taking institution. However, a primary producer may be exempt from this 12 month rule if they've received primary producer category C recovery assistance following a natural disaster under the natural disaster relief and recovery arrangements or are affected by a rainfall deficiency for at least six consecutive months. A financial institution can only offer a farm management deposit product if it meets the Australian government's prudential requirements or is government guaranteed. This includes most banks, credit unions and building societies. When offering farm management deposit accounts, financial institutions must provide clients with a mandatory statement on the scheme's conditions. Financial institutions offering farm management deposit accounts are required to report details of the deposits they hold at the end of each month to the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. As at the 30th of April this year, $5.17 billion was held in approximately 49,000 farm management deposit accounts across Australia. We turn to some of the features of the legal and regulatory framework which applies to finance provided to agricultural businesses. As we have noted, we are focusing on small and medium sized farming businesses in these hearings. In the third round of hearings, which explored lending to small and medium businesses more broadly, we noted that there is little regulation specifically applicable to small business lending in Australia. However, as explained in those hearings, the ASIC Act does provide protection to certain small businesses against misleading and deceptive conduct and unconscionable conduct in connection with lending. The ASIC Act also implies mandatory warranties in contracts for the supply of financial services to small businesses, that the services will be rendered with due care and skill and the services will be reasonably fit for any purpose or required result made known to the supplier by the consumer. As you heard in the third round of hearings, in 2015, Parliament also extended the unfair contract terms provisions of the ASIC Act to standard form small business contracts entered into or renewed on or after the 12th of November 2016. However, as the unfair contract terms provisions only apply where the upfront price payable does not exceed $1 million if the contract is for longer than 12 months or $3 million for the big four banks, these provisions less frequently apply to lending to agricultural businesses. In the third round of hearings, it was also noted that small business lending may be subject to the code of banking practice. The terms of the code form part of any contract a subscribing bank enters into with its, with its customers and will apply to loans to small business where the business has less than 100 full-time or equivalent people if the business is or includes the manufacture of goods. The key provisions of the code were outlined at the beginning of the last round of hearings and we will not repeat them now. We note, Commissioner, that the draft revised Code of Banking Practice submitted to ASIC for approval in December last year 
includes a number of amendments which are relevant to agribusiness customers, including longer minimum notice periods to customers about changes to loan conditions or decisions on rollover, the removal of material adverse change clauses and a reduction in the number of specific events of non-monetary default clauses which can allow a bank to take enforcement action requiring banks to provide to their customers, including farmers, full copies of signed loan applications and other relevant documents, and requiring that the code be incorporated, where relevant, into loan contracts and guarantees. The code has not yet received approval from ASIC, and you will recall, Commissioner, that both Mr Sadat of ASIC and Ms Bly of the ABA gave evidence as to the ongoing discussions about the code between ASIC and the ABA in the last round of hearings. We turn next to dispute resolution schemes accessible to small and medium sized agricultural businesses if they become involved in disputes with financial services entities. We turn first to external dispute resolution mechanisms. As explained in the third round of hearings, the two external dispute schemes that deal with small business lending are currently the Financial Ombudsman Service, FOS, and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman. Each of the entities the subject of the case studies to be explored in these hearings is a member of FOS. In general, FOS can deal with a dispute bet between a business with fewer than 100 employees and a financial services provider that is a member of FOS. However, FOS cannot deal with disputes where the value of the claim exceeds $500,000 or the dispute is about debt recovery against a small business in relation to a credit facility of more than $2 million. There is also a limit on the compensation that FOS can provide, which is currently set at $323,500. FOS and the CIO will have their jurisdiction taken over by the new Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which will have jurisdiction to consider small business disputes. AFCA, as it will be known, will be able to consider claims relating to credit facilities of up to $5 million and will have an expanded compensation cap of $1 million for small business and $2 million for primary producers. We turn to farm debt mediation. Currently, only New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland have legislated farm debt mediation schemes in place. South Australia uses a voluntary scheme, the South Australian Farm Finance Strategy, in combination with the Farming Industry Dispute Resolution Code. Western Australia also operates a voluntary scheme. Farm debt mediation is a structured negotiation process that involves a neutral and independent mediator assisting a farmer and the creditor to try to reach agreement about current and future debt arrangements. The farm debt mediation schemes make it compulsory for banks and other creditors to offer mediation to farmers before taking enforcement action against farm property which includes the farm itself and farm machinery. The farm debt mediation schemes in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland have been estimated by the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences to collectively cover approximately 77% of Australia's farm businesses. In Victoria, the Victorian Small Business Commissioner has statutory dispute resolution functions under the Farm Debt Mediation Act. In the 2016 to 17 financial year, there were 54 dispute applications under the Act, a decrease of 3.6% from the 56 applications received in the previous year. Of the 47 disputes referred to mediation, 45 were successfully resolved, a success rate of 95.7%. In the 2016 to 17 financial year, 73% of farm debt mediations were held in regional Victoria. 
and the Victorian Small Business Commission received $600,000 in funding, which was close to 20% of its total funding for farm debt mediations. In New South Wales, the New South Wales Rural Assistance Authority administers the Farm Debt Mediation Act. This New South Wales Act aims to provide for the efficient and equitable resolution of farm debt disputes. Mediation is required before a creditor can take possession of a property or other enforcement action under a farm mortgage. In the 2016 to 17 financial year, the number of mediations fell to 39 new cases, 34 creditor initiated and six farmer initiated, down from 62 cases in the previous financial year. 40 cases were completed in 2016 to 17, with agreement reached in 90% of the cases that went to mediation. In Queensland, on the 1st of July last year, the Farm Business Debt Mediation Act replaced a voluntary farm debt mediation scheme, the Queensland Farm Finance Strategy. The purpose of the Queensland Act is to provide an efficient and equitable way for farmers and mortgagees to attempt to resolve matters relating to their farm business debts. Again, mediation is required before mortgagees can take possession of a property or other enforcement action under a farm mortgage. The Queensland Rural and Industry Development Authority is responsible for administering the mediation process. Although the three acts are broadly similar, they are not uniform. For example, the New South Wales Act has recently been amended uh, to expand the operation of the New South Wales Act and various other changes have been made, including to allow farmers affected by extreme weather events over an extended period of time to respond to particular notices served under the Act. Several financial services entities have told the Commission that they would support a uniform Farm Debt Mediation Act, either of national application or at least uniform among those states that presently have mandatory farm debt mediation. We turn to the information that the Commission has received from members of the public regarding finance provided to agricultural businesses. We turn first to information received through the Commission website. As at 5pm on the 22nd of June, the Commission had received 6,892 submissions from Australians through its website. Of these submissions, less than 4%, 268 submissions, indicated that they related to agricultural finance. 32 of the submissions received on that topic relate to the ANZ acquisition of Landmark in 2010, to which I will return. The Commission carefully reviewed all public submissions concerning agricultural lending to understand each story and to identify common complaints, themes and geographic concentrations. From there, we spoke with the authors of many of the submissions and called for documents in connection with multiple submissions from the financial services entities so that we could better understand uh, the person submitting um, the form's concerns. The Commission has also consulted with and received information from several rural financial counselling services. The Rural Financial Counselling Services are regional bodies that assist farmers who are in financial distress. The services are funded primarily by the Commonwealth Government and provide free financial counselling to farmers, fishing enterprises, forestry growers and harvesters and small related businesses across Australia in situations of financial hardship. The Commission has spoken with rural financial councillors from the New South Wales Northern, Central and Southern regions, the Victorian Western and Northwestern regions, the Queensland Northern and Southern regions and the Western Australian region. 
In total, more than 20 rural financial councillors have spoken with the Commission. Some have put us in contact with farmers who had not made a submission via the website, but nonetheless had a grievance with a financial services entity. In, in the information provided to the Commission by farmers and by rural financial councillors who represent farmers, three key issues were most frequently raised. The first is that banks have initiated non-monetary defaults through a revaluation of property or security assets, which alters loan to value ratios. Banks then rely upon these deteriorated loan to value ratios to trigger non-monetary defaults. Submissions relating to non-monetary default issues also referred to customers being given unreasonably short time frames to repay substantial proportions of their loans. The second key issue is that farmers have difficulties in accessing appropriate banking services and support, including because of distance from local branches and difficulties contacting their business manager, particularly during times of financial hardship. Some submissions also highlighted the failure of financial services entities to take into account the cash flow impact of seasonal productivity and drought or other natural disasters on agribusiness ventures when making decisions about calling in loans or acting upon loan defaults. The third key issue raised related to changes to, con changes to conditions of lending, such as changes to interest rates, access to facilities such as overdrafts or trading facilities, or changing other conditions in a way that was unfavourable to the customer. In that connection, a number of submissions referred to modifications in lending conditions as a result of structural or ownership changes to the lending institution. The public submissions explain that each of these changes has the potential to result in financial hardship. Another key issue raised with the Commission was the conduct of receivers. The conduct of receivers does not fall within the terms of reference of this Royal Commission because receivers do not fall within any of the categories within the definition of a financial services entity. Most relevantly for present purposes, a receiver cannot be considered to be a person or entity that acts or holds itself out as acting as an intermediary between borrowers and lenders. This is because while receivers are appointed by a bank, they are generally stipulated to be an agent of the borrower and they are subject to a separate and distinct regulatory regime under Chapter 5 of the Corporations Act. As such, the conduct of receivers is not within our terms of reference and will not be examined in these hearings. After our consultation with consumers, financial counsellors and others, we received 13 statements from financial services entities about agricultural lending matters. From those inquiries, the case studies to be pursued at this round of hearings were selected. I'll say more about those case studies shortly. We turn to the information provided to the Commission by financial services entities about their dealings with agricultural business customers and their acknowledged misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to those customers. This information has been provided by entities both in response to correspondence from the Commission and in response to requests for statements from those entities. We will summarise aspects of the responses and statements which are the subject of the entities which are the subject of the case studies. We deal with those entities in alphabetical order. We start with ANZ. ANZ provided multiple submissions to the Commission, including one relating solely to its agribusiness lending activities and has also provided a series of statements from Mr Benjamin Steinberg, its Head of Lending Services, Corporate and Commercial. 
ANZ told the Commission that it currently operates 10 standalone business centres in rural areas of Australia. ANZ currently operates 333 branches in rural areas. This represents a decrease of 91 total rural branches in the last 10 years. The number of branch managers and relationship managers employed in rural areas by ANZ has similarly decreased over the last two years from 726 in 2008 to 541 in 2018. ANZ also provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity. As at the 31st of March this year, <coughs> ANZ had 19,577 agricultural clients, which represents a decrease from 26,150 agricultural clients as at the end of 2009. ANZ told the Commission that as at the 30th of June last year, it reported as agricultural lending activity total credit limits of $9 billion, of which $7.6 billion was outstanding. New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria make up 64% of ANZ's agricultural lending portfolio. As at the 31st of March this year, 2.24% of ANZ agricultural clients have one or more facilities in default. ANZ told the Commission that in the period from 2015 to 2018, it had participated in 34 farm debt mediations, with the largest number for any of these years being 21 mediations in 2015. ANZ also reported that between 2008 and 2017, 162 cases were submitted to FOS in respect of its agricultural clients. The highest number was 41 in 2014. Of the 162 cases submitted in this period, two resulted in recommendations adverse to ANZ and three resulted in determinations adverse to ANZ. In the period from 2015 to 2018, ANZ has taken enforcement action against 30 agricultural customers. In its submissions, ANZ disclosed several instances of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to agribusiness customers. First, ANZ accepted that in certain respects, its management of some former customers of Landmark Financial Services following ANZ's acquisition of the Landmark Loan Book fell below community standards and expectations. ANZ also acknowledged that in a small number of cases, its conduct in relation to former Landmark customers may have constituted a breach of the obligation in the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards its customers. ANZ acknowledged that it should have been more responsive and empathetic to some former landmark customers, particularly given their difficult financial circumstances, and it acknowledged that its failure to do so caused distress in some cases. As we will explain in more detail later in this opening statement, ANZ's handling of former landmark customers will be the subject of the first case study in these hearings. Second, ANZ told the Commission that in some instances, dealings between its commercial collections team and agribusiness customers had breached the Code of Banking Practice and the ASIC Debt Collection Guidelines. ANZ also told the Commission that between December 2013 and June 2014, FOS identified an instance of improper collections activity by ANZ in relation to a particular agribusiness customer. Third, ANZ identified system and process errors that affected its small business customers and said that some of these errors affected agribusiness customers. Fourth, 
ANZ identified instances where its frontline staff engaged in inappropriate sales practices in an effort to increase incentive payments and said it was likely that some of these instances involved agribusiness lending. We turn to Bank West. Bank West is a wholly owned subsidiary of CBA and we will address CBA's agricultural operations separately. Bank West has provided a statement to the Commission that relates to its agribusiness lending activities from Sinead Taylor, its Executive General Manager, Personal and Business Banking. Bankwest told the Commission that as at June last year, it operated 44 retail branches and business centres in rural areas. This represents a decrease of 25 rural retail branches and business centres over the last 10 years. The number of branch managers and relationship managers employed in rural areas has also decreased over the last 10 years from 52 to 47 branch managers and from 81 to 44 business development and relationship managers. Bankwest provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity. As at the 30th of June last year, Bankwest had 3,638 agricultural customers, of which 1,600 were agricultural lending customers. 91% of Bankwest's total agricultural lending is in Western Australia. As at the 30th of June last year, 1.71% of Bankwest agricultural clients were in monetary default and 1.66% were in non-monetary default. Bankwest told the Commission that in the period from 2008 to 2018, it had participated in 47 farm debt mediations. Bankwest also reported that between 2008 and 2018, 36 agricultural customers made FOS complaints. Of those cases, three resulted in determinations wholly or partly in favour of the customer. Bankwest told the Commission that over the last 10 years, it has taken enforcement action against 34 agricultural customers. We will come to the acknowledgements by Bankwest of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations as the acknowledgements made by CBA in its submissions also covered Bank West. We turn next to Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, which we'll refer to as Bendigo Bank. Bendigo Bank provided two submissions to the Commission, one of which related solely to agribusiness lending activities, and also provided a statement from Alexandra Gartman the CEO and Managing Director of Rural Bank, which was acquired by Bendigo Bank in 2009 and 10. Bendigo Bank told the Commission that it currently operates 283 branches in rural areas of Australia. This represents an increase of 79 rural branches over the last 10 years. The number of branch managers and relationship managers employed by Bendigo Bank and Rural Bank in rural areas has also increased over the last 10 years. Bendigo Bank provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity as well as Rural Bank's agricultural clients and lending activity. As at 2018, Bendigo Bank had 2,637 agricultural clients and Rural Bank had 8,150 agricultural clients. As at the 31st of March this year, an average of 1.06% of Bendigo Bank agricultural clients and 3.91% of Rural Bank agricultural clients had one or more facilities in default. Bendigo Bank reported that over the last 10 years it had participated in nine farm debt mediations and Rural Bank had participated in 76 farm debt mediations. Bendigo Bank also reported that during this period 15 cases were submitted to FOS in respect of its agricultural clients 
and of these only one resulted in a false recommendation or determination which was in Bendigo Bank's favour. <coughs> During this period, 65 cases were submitted to FOS in respect of rural banks' agricultural clients. Of these, eight resulted in a FOS recommendation or determination, one of which was in the client's, the customer's favour. Over the last 10 years, Bendigo Bank has taken enforcement action against six agricultural customers and Rural Bank has taken enforcement action against 67 agricultural customers. In its submissions, Bendigo Bank identified five examples of instances in which the conduct of Rural Bank in relation to agricultural loans had fallen below community standards and expectations. The first example concerned Rural Bank's response to a notification by a customer that her signature had been forged by her husband on documents to increase the limit of their agricultural loan facilities and that her signature on some of the banks had been improperly witnessed by an agent of the bank. Rural Bank had advised the customer to report the matter to the police but did not investigate the matter itself, relying on the police investigation which is yet to be concluded some years later. The second example concerned an incident in 2016 when Rural Bank erroneously charged fees on season overdraft and agri-manager products. The error affected 2,164 customers and the overall financial impact was $163,461. All customers were remediated. The third example involved the underpayment of interest on term deposit accounts for a period of up to five years. 81 customers were affected, with the total financial impact being $10,166. All customers were remediated. The fourth example involved a situation in 2015 where a relationship manager had verbally approved a loan above the manager's designated lending authority. In reliance on this approval, the customers successfully bid on a property. Their loan application was subsequently declined on the basis that it did not meet lending criteria. After the customers threatened legal action, rural banks settled their complaint by paying them the deposit amount as compensation. The fifth example involved failures to make appropriate inquiries and verifications prior to the approval of loans taken out by a number of customers in the Queensland cattle industry, which became non-performing loans. <coughs> Rural bank staff did not appropriately establish loan serviceability, over-relied on security values and did not adequately manage the loans. This matter will be the subject of one of the case studies in these hearings. We turn next to CBA. CBA has provided multiple submissions to the Commission, one of which relates solely to its agribusiness lending activities and each of which also covers Bank West. CBA has also provided statements from Grant Cairns, Executive Manager Regional and Agribusiness Banking, Mark Blozak, General Manager, Group Credit Structuring, Corporate, and Joanna White, Managing Director of Business Lending. CBA told the Commission that as at the 30th of April this year, it operated 57 business centres in rural areas of Australia. CBA also operated 349 branches in rural areas. This represents a decrease of 10 rural business centres and 20 rural branches over the last 10 years. The number of branch managers and relationship managers employed in rural areas has also decreased over this period by around 23%. CBA also provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity. As at the 27th of May this year, CBA had 25,261 agricultural client relationships 
and 4,999 agricultural lending relationships. Currently, approximately 144 of CBA's agricultural clients are in regulatory default. CBA reported that it had participated in 113 farm debt mediations over the last 10 years, with the largest number for any of these years being 31 in 2013. CBA also reported that between 2011 and 2018, 87 cases were submitted to FOS in respect of its agricultural clients. Of these cases, three resulted in recommendations or determinations adverse to CBA. CBA told the Commission that it has taken enforcement action against 82 agricultural customers over the last 10 years. In its submission provided to the Commission on the 29th of January this year, CBA said that there had been some suggestions in recent years that enforcement action in relation to farms had been excessively high and that such decisions were taken in haste by financial institutions with little engagement with customers. CBA indicated that this was not its experience. In lengthy tables provided to the Commission in March this year, CBA disclosed five instances of agriculture finance related misconduct. Further information about four of these instances was pro provided by CBA in its May submission to the Commission, which dealt solely uh, with agribusiness issues. Of those four instances, three related to CBA's Agri Advantage Plus and Agri Advantage Products. The three instances were as follows. First, CBA disclosed an incident relating to a failure to apply fee waivers and ongoing package benefits, such as bonus credit interest, to eligible customers who purchased an Agri Advantage Plus package. That package is directed at customers in the regional and agribusiness segment. CBA disclosed that it had reported the incident to ASIC and that it had completed a remediation program in 2015, by which it reimbursed approximately 8,400 customers the sum of approximately $7.6 million. This incident was the subject of a statement by Joanna White, Managing Director of Business Lending, which will be tendered in these hearings. Second, CBA disclosed that it had also had an earlier related issue with its Agri Advantage product relating to an instance of overdraft line fee overcharging. CBA identified the issue in September 2012 and a total of 265 accounts were impacted. CBA conducted a remediation program in April 2013 which resulted in refunds totalling approximately $72,000. The instance was not reported to ASIC. Third, CBA disclosed a further issue, which like the first issue, related to the Agri Advantage Plus package. The issue involved certain customers not being provided with concessions offered under the package's terms of offer. The issue was identified in July 2014 and was reported to ASIC on the day it was identified. The fourth instance, which was not related to Agri Advantage Plus or Agri Advantage Products, related to a product called the Agri Options product. The instance of misconduct related to an estimated overcharging of fees in respect of that product, which was identified in about September 2012 and reported to ASIC. A total of 726 accounts were Im impacted. A remediation program was completed in October 2012 and resulted in fee refunds to affected customers of approximately $330,000. In addition to these four instances of misconduct, CBA also disclosed one instance of potentially inappropriate advice 
which in part may have related to CBA agribusiness products. CBA told the Commission that this issue was reported to ASIC in March 2015. In its May submission dealing with agribusiness, CBA provided information specifically about additional agricultural finance related issues. First, CBA noted that 16 additional incidents had been disclosed to the Commission when CBA provided the Commission with data from its Risk Insight system. These incidents had originally been omitted from the table of misconduct provided in March because the compliance incident record had been rated insignificant or low. Second, CBA disclosed to the Commission that it had identified two further operational incidents which had not been included in the table of misconduct provided in March. In 2013, CBA identified risk management issues in the regional and agribusiness banking division of business and private banking. The risk management issues related to potential interest rate management mis-selling. More specifically, the issues related to interest rate hedges that did not match customer loan terms, as well as customers stating that they were unclear of terms and conditions. CBA identified 19 customers potentially impacted by the issue, including 10 agribusiness customers. CBA told the Commission it is conducting individual remediations in respect of this issue. As at the date of its letter to the Commission, CBA had closed 18 cases and had refunded a total of $1.37 million to those customers. $660,000 of that amount was refunded to agribusiness customers. As at the date of the letter to the Commission, one case remained outstanding. And the second operational incident also related to 2013 when CBA identified an incident regarding the incorrect mapping of a reference rate for an agricultural line of credit product onto a banking platform. CBA remedied, remediated customers to the value of approximately $78,000. Third, CBA also made some disclosures in relation to individual CBA clients, including clients in whose favour the Financial Ombudsman Service had resolved disputes. We turn next to NAB. NAB has also provided multiple submissions to the Commission, including one relating solely to its agribusiness lending activities. NAB has also provided a statement from Mr Ross McNaughton, General Manager, Strategic Business Services. NAB told the Commission that as at April this year, it operated 177 branches in rural areas. This represents a decrease of 13 rural branches over the last 10 years. The number of branch managers employed in rural areas has also decreased over that period from 136 to 120 employees. NAB provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity. As at the 30th of June last year, NAB had 20,997 agricultural clients. NAB told the Commission that as at that date, the 30th of June last year, in all states and territories other than Tasmania, less than 0.5% of its agricultural borrowers had a loan which was more than 90 days past due. The highest total value of loans past 90 days due was in New South Wales at $14.7 million, followed by Victoria, $9.3 million, and Western Australia, $4.09 million. As at the 30th of June last year, 1.06% of NAB agricultural clients had one or more facilities in default. NAB reported that over the last 10 years, it had participated in 245 farm debt mediations. <coughs> NAB also reported that between 2010 and May 2018, 262 cases were submitted to FOS in respect of its agricultural clients. Of these, 
12 resulted in recommendations or determinations adverse to NAB. NAB told the Commission that it has taken enforcement action against 173 agricultural customers over the last 10 years. In its submission provided to the Commission in January this year, NAB admitted in a generalised way that it had breached various provisions of the Code of Banking Practice in its dealings with agricultural customers. One example concerned failing to pay interest on customer accounts. However, despite this, NAB did not admit any misconduct in respect of agricultural customers. In its second submission, NAB identified numerous events of misconduct that had been logged in its risk management system, Risk Smart, since 2013. Over 85 of these events concerned agricultural clients. The Commission has reviewed those entries. Themes that emerge include failures by NAB to advise or communicate with its agribusiness customers about who is responsible for stamping and registration fees, and misunderstandings or disagreements between NAB and its customers about key aspects or functions of customer products and accounts, such as whether a deposit account operates as an offset account or what the interest rate or term of a particular product is. Save for identifying the particular risk smart entries that related to agribusiness clients in its initial two responses, NAB did not identify any other misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in the submission it provided solely in relation to agricultural lending activities in May. We turn finally to Rabobank. Rabobank is a Dutch bank that specialises in banking to the food and ag agribusiness industries. Unusually for a bank of its size, it has a cooperative structure and is not listed on any stock exchange. Rabobank has provided two submissions to the Commission relating to its agribusiness lending activities and uh, two statements from Mr Bradley James, Regional Manager for Southern Queensland and New South Wales. Rabobank informed the Commission that it currently operates 61 branches in rural areas. This represents an increase of 10 rural branches over the last 10 years. The number of branch managers and relationship managers employed in rural areas also increased over the last 10 years from 170 to 235 employees in these roles. Rabobank provided information regarding its agricultural clients and lending activity. As at the 31st of December last year, Rabobank had 33,970 agricultural clients and 21,436 agricultural client groups. Of these, 11,050 agricultural clients and 8,750 agricultural client groups had active loans. As at the 30th of June last year, 0.69% of Rabobank agricultural clients had one or more facilities in default. Rabobank reported that over the last 10 years it had participated in 99 farm debt mediations. Rabobank also reported that between January 2008 and May 2018, 37 cases were submitted to faults in respect of its agricultural clients. Of those cases, one resulted in a recommendation or determination adverse to Rabobank. Rabobank told the Commission that it has taken enforcement action against 59 agricultural customers in the period from 2008 to 2017. Rabobank acknowledged seven instances of conduct directly relating to agribusiness lending that involved misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. Three of these involved the incorrect application of interest rates across a number of different types of accounts and over a number of different time periods. 
One involved the overcharging of fees to 126 clients in 2011 with a total financial impact of $372,000. The remaining three involved the conduct of three employees, one of whom had amended documents after they had been executed by a customer on more than one occasion, one of whom failed to disclose a conflict of interest through involvement with a customer and by executing a bank document on behalf of that customer, and one of whom had entered into personal commercial arrangements with customers that were not disclosed to the bank. In addition to receiving and analysing the submission and statements from these financial services entities to which I have just referred, the Commission issued 50 notices to produce to 11 agricultural lenders. These notices yielded close to 12,000 documents about various aspects of each entity's practices, procedures and conduct, both generally and in relation to particular cases. We turn now to the particular case studies through which the conduct of financial services entities will be addressed in these hearings in relation to the topic of finance to agricultural customers. <coughs> the first case study will examine issues arising from ANZ's acquisition of the loan and deposit books of landmark financial services in 2010. We should make clear, Commissioner, that when we refer to landmark in these hearings, we are referring to landmark financial services. Landmark Financial Services was a division of Landmark that provided agribusiness loans and deposit accounts to customers. Landmark was, and still is, a diversified agribusiness company. When we refer to Landmark in these hearings, we are not referring to the other businesses still operated by Landmark. For some years, it has been clear that a significant number of former Landmark customers felt that they were treated unfairly by ANZ after its acquisition of loan Landmark's loan and deposit books. In late 2015 and early 2016, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Inquiry into the Impairment of Customer Loans examined matters associated with ANZ's acquisition of these loan and deposit books. Complaints about ANZ's dealings with former Landmark customers have also featured significantly in public submissions received by the Commission. Around 12% of the submissions received by the Commission that related to agricultural lending concerned a Landmark loan that was acquired by ANZ. The Commission obtained four statements from ANZ in relation to this matter. One of those statements deals with ANZ's acquisition of the Landmark Loan Book and the bank's dealings with agribusiness customers more generally, and three relate to seven specific cases of former Landmark customers. Of those cases, four concern cattle farms based in Queensland, one concerns a sheep farm based in Western Australia, one concerns a mixed cropping farm based in Victoria, and one concerns a forestry business based in Tasmania. The first case study will consider ANZ's conduct in connection with the acquisition of the Landmark Loan Book, both at a general level and through the lens of these specific cases. The second, third and fourth case studies examine the conduct of three banks, Rabobank, Bankwest and NAB, in connection with loans made to three sets of Queensland cattle farmers, the Browers, the Ruddies and the Smiths. The issues that were experienced by these cattle farmers expose a number of the difficulties faced by Queensland cattle farmers in the past 10 years. Some of these difficulties were triggered or exacerbated by a series of external factors impacting the Queensland cattle industry over this period, including a decline in property prices, a decline in cattle prices, a number of severe weather events, including both drought and cyclone-related flooding, and the live cattle export ban. 
Each of these three case studies raises issues that warrant investigation, including issues about responsible lending, the use of property valuations, the provision of hardship assistance by banks, the adequacy of the farm debt mediation process, and bank practices in connection with the charging of default interest. The final case study concerns loans made by Rural Bank to Queensland cattle industry farmers, particularly in the period from 2003 to 2007. This case study will tie together some of the themes identified in the earlier case studies by examining the impact of Rural Bank's loan origination and loan monitoring practices on its Queensland loan portfolio. Before moving to those case studies, we intend to call three witnesses with experience in rural and agricultural finance to give concurrent evidence. Those witnesses are Mr Dennis McMahon of Legal Aid Queensland, Mr Warren Day of ASIC, and Mr Chris Wheatcroft of the Rural Financial Counselling Service in Western Australia. Commissioner, that concludes the opening address for the agricultural finance part of this block of hearings. Might we briefly adjourn to allow the panel to convene? How long do you need, Ms Hall? Uh, I think in, if we came back at uh, quarter two, that would be fine. Quarter two, very well. I'll go back quarter to uh, midday. Thank you, Commissioner. Hold <coughs>